Good morning, class. Good morning, Brother Keith. Hi, I'm Keith Moore, and we welcome you to Faith School. Faith School's the place where my spirit gets fed, where my faith grows stronger, where I learn how to be an overcomer. You know, Jesus, when he was ministering on the earth, he made uh, multiple references to people's faith. To some, he said, uh, how is it that you have no faith? To others, he said, O ye of little faith. And to a few, he said, great faith. I hadn't seen great faith like this anywhere else. So faith is not uh, static. There's not just a standard level that everybody has. When you're born again, you have a measure of the God kind of faith in you. But then it depends on what you do with it. If you do nothing with it, it'll just sit there and undeveloped and, and won't grow. But if you'll feed your faith and you'll use it, it'll develop. Hallelujah. And you'll grow up spiritually, which is why we confess this in the front. You'll grow up spiritually. And you know, there are, there are things that 30-year-olds can understand that three-year-olds just can't. And it's not that they're dumb uh, or, or, you know, don't have the abilities. It's just undeveloped. It takes time to develop the capacity. And so it is with the children of God. As newborn babes, he says, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And so that's why we're confessing these things. They're not just statements uh, they are reality. It's happening. And I believe, I'm believing uh, for you and with you, if you'll hook with me, that you start on these faith classes and they're all available back to the beginning. Uh, there, there are hundreds of them now and we're believing there'll be more hundreds to come. And uh, you go back and feed on those, and feed on those, and not just feed on them, but then in life when something comes up, use your faith. Exercise your faith. Speak words of faith. Faith actions over a period of weeks and months and years. You'll become a different individual. People that hadn't seen you in a while will be surprised. They'll be like, wow, you've changed. <laughs> You're different, right? And it'll be in a good different, more like the master. Get your Bible, get something to make a note with. Come on into the classroom. Let's believe today. Father, all of us agree together uh, as touching this, asking you for utterance, anointing, answers, grace, direction, help, healing, deliverance, restoration, exactly what is your will, what you know is most needful for right now. We reach for it, we ask for it, and by faith, believe we receive it. By faith, thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Somebody say, thank you for it, Lord. You, Lord. See, faith goes ahead and thanks. <laughs> Gives thanks before it sees or feels. In uh, Hebrews, uh, the third chapter, if you would look again, please. We've been on a, a topic that we're calling overcoming unbelief. In uh, Hebrews 3, and verse 12, he said, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. And we uh, we've saw numerous scriptures, previous studies about how that unbelief has robbed God's people of what they should have had, what they should have enjoyed. This was talking about the first group that God delivered out of Egyptian bondage, that first generation, and all the miracles that he did, only later to have them fail 
to go into the promised land he had picked out for them, have them wander around out in the wilderness, hard life, die young, die wrong, contrary to the will of God. And the reason we're told that happened, down here in verse uh, 18 and 19, to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not. So we see they, that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Like we were saying before, they thought they couldn't go in because they weren't strong enough. They thought they couldn't go in because the enemy was too strong. They thought it was the giants. They thought it was the, the walled cities. They thought it was their advanced weaponry, their iron chariots and, and, and all of these, their superior armies and, and warriors. None of that was true. None of that was true. That's acting like there's no God. That's comparing all the need and problem just to yourself. And you will get depressed <laughs> if you just keep doing that. <laughs> and you will come to the conclusion, I can't do this. Well, you should have known that to start with, right? <laughs> Why it take you so long to come to this conclusion? You cannot do it on your own. You are not enough by yourself, but you're not by yourself. Amen. Oh, come on, somebody say, I'm not by myself. I'm not by myself. You're not by yourself. And the one who is with you, he makes all that stuff look small. Is that right? That's why Caleb and Joshua could say, let's go now. Let's go get it. Their defense has departed from them. They're bred for us. Let's do this thing. Let's take. They saw the same thing the other guys saw, but they have a completely different response. Why? They chose to believe what God said, that he was with them, that he had given it to them, that he could do whatever it took. And they chose to look at the giants and believe it was impossible. It was a choice. Faith is a choice. Unbelief is a choice. Fear is a choice. Faith is a choice. Now, when you say that, many people, even church going people, still don't believe it. If somebody has yielded to depression, if they've yielded to fear and panic, if they've yielded to unbelief, you can get in such a mess. You can get so despondent. You can get suicidal. And if you were to just come to them and say, quit that. <laughs> Stop that. Stop worrying. Stop fearing. Stop it. What would many of them say to you? <laughs> You're liable to get cussed out. <laughs> but... <laughs> but in some form or fashion, what would be the, the, the idea that they would convey to you? They can't. They believe they can't. They can't. Um, and yet, the truth is, you can. And especially a believer who has the help of God, I can do all things. Not just by myself, but through Christ who strengthens me. Oh, can you say amen? amen. Can you say amen? amen? One of the greatest revelations, and the Bible said that the truth you know will make you free. One of the greatest revelations you can get is that you don't have to think anything you don't want to think. You don't have to. Now, the enemy does not want you to believe that because he will lose control when you believe that. But the truth is, your mind is your mind. You can't control everything going on out here. But you can control what's going on inside here. You can control 
your response. You can control what you listen to. You can control what you look at. You can control what you think about. You can control what you talk about. And if you can do that, it changes your world. I said it changes your world. My father in the faith, Kenneth Hagin, used to say, uh, uh, talking about thoughts, he said, uh, you can't prevent a bird from flying over your head, but you can prevent him from building a nest in your hair. <laughs> What's he talking about? You can't prevent the enemy from bringing a thought to you. This is coming from out here, from outside, not from inside you, from out here. Uh, I, I heard one man of God say this. He said, uh, even the most holy saint of God, living holily talking about, has found uh, coming to their mind at times ungodly and repulsive and ugly thoughts. And if that happens, many times people, you know, the enemy, he brought you the thought. And then he comes on the other side and says, aren't you ugly? <laughs> Thinking that thought? Are you even saved? Are you even a Christian? He's the one that brought you the thought. <laughs> and then he'll turn around and accuse you for thinking the thought. And that's what the scripture says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought. Somebody say every thought. Every, every thought to the obedience of, of Christ. There needs to be some casting down, some slapping down, some knocking down of what? Of these thoughts, of these fears, these worries, these anxieties. And in so doing, you protect yourself and you, you refuse to yield to this unbelief he's warning us about. That's how it gets a grip on people. Any of us, if we let it, thoughts, feelings, and then you, you don't do anything with them, you just let them sit on you, and you just entertain them, and you, you mull over them, and you meditate them, and you talk them, and then somebody else wants to talk about it, and you talk to them about it two hours, and <laughs> that's how you lose your joy, you lose your peace. You lose your victory perspective and you are getting in the grips of unbelief. And that will rob anybody. It robbed them, kept them out of the promised land. And it's keeping people out of the blessings of God today. Somebody say, thank you, Lord. My mind is my mind. I don't have to think. Anything, Anything I, don't to I don't choose to think, I can resist, I can resist ungodly, thoughts. ungodly thoughts. I can choose peace, I can choose peace and, joy and joy and resist fear, and, resist fear and, depression. and depression, and I choose to. And I choose to. Hallelujah. Now, I wish I could tell you that you could do it one time and you're set, <laughs> but oh man. The enemy is a persistent cuss. <laughs> and all his cohorts, that's their job, to bring against you these lies, these deceptions, this confusion, all this stuff. And if it comes against your mind a hundred times a day, tell me what you got to do. What do you got to do? You cast it down a hundred times a day. Right? Yes. And if you cast it down 99 and then let that last one sit on you, you're losing a battle. Come on, can you see that? Yes. You cannot make exceptions. You cannot have a disconnect, feel sorry for me day. Ever. Oh, somebody didn't like that. Ever. <laughs> Unless you want to be robbed. Unless you want to be robbed of what Jesus already bought and paid for and given to us. See, the promised land was already theirs. The Bible said God had already ordained that before the foundation of the world. He'd been looking forward to them going in and enjoying it. But the first generation, he could not convince. 
he could not convince them to believe him, to trust him. And, and eventually, they were never going to change. And so, they forfeited what they should have enjoyed. That's sad. I said, that's sad. I don't want that to be me. That doesn't mean you lost. You mean you still go to heaven when you die, but you were robbed in this life of things you could have had, should have been, should have enjoyed, should have had to minister to others. God didn't intend for us just to barely survive. He intended for us to overcome. Is that right? Sometimes people are saying, oh, you know, please come back, Lord. Please come back. And what they mean is, I owe money. I need to get out of here. And <laughs> he's coming back for a victorious church. Yeah, he's coming back. But he needs to come back with us with our foot on the devil's neck. <laughs> Shouting victory. Is that right? Taking ground. Hallelujah for him. <laughs> coming back for a victorious church. Go with me, if you would, over to Mark, the fourth chapter. Mark chapter four. The thing we have to do is identify this ugly, evil unbelief that, that the scripture is talking about. Because if you don't recognize it, you won't resist it. And so that's what's happening now. And that's what, what I believe we're led to do for some days and weeks to come. Is we are going, you and I, you and I, we are going to become uh, taught and we're going to recognize afar off this ugly thing called unbelief. And we're not going to be ignorant of the enemy's devices. And we are going to stop it before it starts. Resist it before it begins to take hold. And we'll not be robbed. In uh, Mark 4, verse 35, after they had been in meetings and ministry, said the same day when even was come, Mark 4, 35, uh, Jesus said to them, let us pass over to the other side. Now, if you're familiar with, with this story, you know some of the things that happened next. Notice he didn't say, let's go halfway and drown. <laughs> now, the reason I say that, everything, every word the Lord tells you is significant, and you can stand on every word that he says. Uh, Abraham is our father in the faith. He's held up forever as an example of trust in God. And I, I reckon the, the ultimate test of his faith was when God told him to give him his son Isaac. And he had, he had shown faith for years and decades prior to that, and it all led up to this. And we know looking back, this is covenant. Uh, he's willing to give his only begotten son. Does that have a ring to it? To anybody? Uh, and God gave his only begotten son for mankind. This is covenant. This is big, big, big. But nobody made Abraham do this. You got to remember, I mean, it's easy for us to read about it, but there was a morning when this hadn't happened yet, and he's got the directive to go do it. And he takes the boy, and they're headed to the mountain. And people say, that's ridiculous. No parent would ever do that. No, this is just a faith beyond what you understand. Because when you find out the whole story and you put Hebrews together with Genesis and, these, and the whole thing, you see that Abraham had already concluded that if the boy did die on the mountain, God was going to have to raise him from the dead. Right there. <laughs> so he's believing for resurrection. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> offering your only begotten son, believing for resurrection. This is as gospel as it gets. And how could he believe for that though? 
You can't just believe for something randomly by pulling something out of the air. The scripture said, he remembered that God had said, in Isaac, your seed will be called. What am I talking about? Let's go over to the other side. What does that mean? Can you stand on that? Can, huh? How does faith come? Faith comes by hearing what he said. Don't try to stand on things you fabricate. You can only stand faith in him in what he told you. But oh, every word he told you. So what if Abraham hadn't been paying attention? <laughs> he would have had nothing to base his faith on. But when God, I'm sure when God told him, bring, bring your son Isaac up to the mountain, offer him up to me. I'm sure the initial hit of that was, oh God, what? You know, and, and so he's searching, he's searching, why, why would God tell me that? Why would God ask me for that? Why would God say that to me? And uh, he's searching his heart and he's searching all of his experience and his conversations with God. And, and then he decided, well, I'm going to trust God. I'm going to do what he told me to do. And, and so he's getting ready to do it. And then it comes back to him. In Isaac, your seed will be called. And he does a little analysis and goes, well, now, if he's dead, he can't have any kids. And if he not have any kids, it can't be in Isaac. He said, God's going to raise him from the dead. I'm going to see a miracle today. Oh, come on, can you see that? That's why he could go through with it. That's why the angel had to stop him, because he was doing it. He didn't believe he's just going to see a death. He believed he's going to see a resurrection. And the Bible says, and in a manner, he did receive him. Because God saw in his heart, he did it. And so actually Abraham believed for the resurrection of Jesus on that mountain. Because if, he's, if God's man, his friend, is willing to do it for him, God has every right to do it for his man. Oh, come on, can you see that? And you know what the core of all this is? Faith. Right? Trust. Trust. God trusted Abram that he'd fulfill his part of the, the covenant. And Abraham trusted in God that he loved him. He wasn't trying to hurt him. He wasn't trying to steal something from him. And whatever it took, he would make his word come to pass. Is that right? And as far as he can see, it's going to take a resurrection. So if that's what it takes, it's what it takes. Right here. He says, let's pass over to the other side. You know, my father in the faith, Kenneth Hagin, and I, we traveled with him, had the privilege of traveling with him for years. And um, eventually he got an airplane. What a blessing it was because they could do more meetings. They were in their 80s and uh, it's just so much easier. And uh, every time we'd take off nearly, he'd say, let's pass over to the other side. <laughs> Maybe everybody didn't know what he's saying, but that means we ain't going halfway and crashing. <laughs> we're going up and we're coming back down safely. Come on, try that out loud. Let's go over to the other side. What does that mean? Complete your journey. Complete your mission. And is there power in the Word of God to bring to pass every word that he said? When they had sent the multitude away, they took him even as he was in the ship, and there were also with him other little ships, and there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. He was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they wake him and say to him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? <laughs> Do you not care? We're all going to drown out here. He arose, he rebuked the wind. Well, you can be sure that the father was not in the wind. 
or he wouldn't have rebuked it. The father wasn't in the storm. God wasn't in the storm. God is not in all storms. No. He rebuked the wind. Then he said to the sea, peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. There were power, there's power in those words. Was there power in, let's go over to the other side? The other, whether you saw it or not, there was just as much power in those words as in these words. And so then he turns and looks to them and says, man, I'm glad you woke me up. <laughs> if you'd have waited a little bit later, it would have been too late. No, uh-uh. No. What did he say? Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Now let's just stop right here. Is the Lord unreasonable? No. Somebody needs to say that. The Lord is not unreasonable. The Lord is not unreasonable. He is not. Did he expect more of them? Yes. He did. Then if he expected more, that means they could have done better. They should have done better. Better than what? Better than yielding to fear. Better than panicking and yielding to unbelief. And notice, why, why are you so fearful? When the Lord asks a question, he wants a response. And the reason he said that is because they did not have a, a legitimate reason. They couldn't say, well, there's a storm. Yeah, but you've seen miracles. Right? You have seen things happen. You know what God can do. It was a choice, wasn't it? They made the wrong choice in the boat that night. And here's the thing. When the Lord says, why are you so full of fear, fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And so they said, woo, woo, sorry. We're quitting right now. No. <laughs> no. Verse 41 so then what they do? Feared exceedingly. No, <laughs> you're going the wrong way, right? He's saying, stop the fear. And when he tells them, stop the fear, they go, oh, more fear. Exceedingly fear. What am I saying? Could they have responded differently? Could they have stopped fearing? But see, they didn't believe they could. Even when Jesus is telling them not to, it's got to be a revelation. I said, it's got to be a revelation. And our time's up again. <laughs> As you can see, there's more to this, but say it out loud, I don't have to fear. I, don't have to fear. I choose to believe. I choose to believe. We'll see you soon back here in Faith School. I've got the victory living inside. Thank you for joining us at Faith School. Class is dismissed for today, but you can watch this and other episodes of Faith School free of charge at faithschool.org. For more information, visit our website or call us at 941-702-7390.